Let's try that again, all right? Oh. Good morning. That's a little better. We welcome you today to Memorial United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're here. And if you are visiting, we welcome you warmly in the name of our Lord. If you are new to the community and looking for a church, this is your place. This is where you want to be and we want you to be. So we welcome everyone in the name of the Lord today. I have a few announcements. We will not have library day today. Unfortunately, Miss Beth is unable to be here today, but we will reschedule for a later date. Our pumpkins will arrive on Wednesday afternoon around three o'clock and we need help. Help to meet the trailer from the farm and unload the pumpkins. And if you can assist, please meet us at the family Life Center parking lot around 3 p.m. on Wednesday. It should not take long if we have enough hands uh, to do the work. And then supper at 6 on Wednesday, there is a form on the bulletin for you to uh, make your reservation. And if you come to help with the pumpkins, uh, and attend the supper at six, you will have the first choice of pumpkins to purchase. Next Sunday, October 5th, is Children's Sabbath service <clears throat> at 9 a.m. One note about the bulletin, the anthem, Come Christians Join to Sing has a page number after it. Please ignore that because it is not a hymn and you are not to stand and sing. <laughs> that is only for the choir. And I wonder, ushers, if you have prayer cards, if you have a prayer request and would like to fill it out and pass it to the aisle. We'll have Usher pick it up and bring it forward that during the prayer time, we may make note of your prayer request. Let us begin our worship.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Give us, O Lord our God, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may finally embrace you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn is number 64. Please stand to sing. remain standing for our affirmation of faith found on page 881 the Apostles Creed We're reading today the traditional version I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
you. You may be seated. And children, it's time for children's time if you'll come forward. kind of um, short on numbers today, but that kind of is what we're going to talk about today. Has anyone ever said to you, small things are important? Ever heard that from anybody? Have you ever heard that a lot of small things can be very important too? Little things are important. And lots of little things make big things. I have a little something in my pocket here. I'm sure you know what it is. I'm going to talk about two things today. What is this? A penny. Is a penny a little thing or a big thing? It's a little thing. But you know, I was thinking, if you, the two of you, and I, and just suppose we included all these other people who are sitting in this sanctuary. If we saved every penny that passed through our hands, instead of spending it, if we saved it for a whole year, do you think we might have a good bit of money? If everybody for a whole year saved every penny? If I save every penny, for a whole year, or you save one penny for every day in a year, I would have $3.65. Is that more money than just this? You know, I might could um, get somebody to take me to the dollar store. I might could have a good time at the dollar store with $3.65, right? Or you know, I could take that money and I might give it to the children at Epworth Children's Home. Or I might take it and give it to the soup kitchen. And if everybody in here did that, we would have a lot of money. Something else I have in my pocket that's a little thing. What is this? It's a nail. Is it a big nail? It's a little nail, but it's important. If you needed this, you could use it maybe if you had a chair that was a little bit wobbly and you thought it might be was going to fall down or something. This nail might make it real good and sturdy. But if you only had just this one nail, you might could put it up in the wall and you might could hang a picture on it. So does it have a purpose? Is it important? Is it little? Yes. Do you know a house is built with nails? Uh, it takes thousands and thousands of nails to build a house. But that house would not be as strong unless every one of those nails was there. Because where it is, it's serving a purpose. There is somebody in the Bible. His name was Zechariah. And if you look in your Old Testament, there's a book that you can read that has the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was given the job of having the people who had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild God's great temple. Now what had happened to the temple? It had been destroyed because the people had been at war. So the people had been out of the country, they'd been in exile, and they came back and Zechariah says, God has said he wants us to rebuild the temple. They were so excited. They were going to do that thing. And they started. They laid the foundation. The foundation is the most important thing. It has to be strong so that the rest of the building will be strong too. But you know what? After a little while, they got tired. They were not as enthusiastic as they were at first. And they complained. They said, we don't have enough help. 
We don't have enough materials. We just think we're going to stop. And Zechariah had a message for them. It's written in the fourth chapter of Zechariah, the 10th verse. Who here despises little things? Well, nobody, what does despise mean? It means doesn't like or might hate. Well, nobody wanted to say they despise little things, but they said, look, we're getting so little bit done. It's taking a long time. But Zachariah said, if we work together, we can get more people to come and we can build the temple. And you know what? They did. They built that temple and they were able to see the last stone put in it. So I'm going to ask you if you'll remember one thing that we've talked about today. Little things are important. Little things we do, little things we say, little people who we might be are important. And when you do a lot of little things, then you have big things. Would you bow your heads? And I'd like for you to pray after me. Dear God, we ask you to help us in all the little things we do, all the little things we say, and we will try to do your will. Amen.
Thank you, choir. We have an excellent choir here. Do you agree? Do you agree? We have an excellent choir. Thank you so much. I have not received any written special prayer requests, but you may have someone on your heart that you are concerned about, a friend, relative, someone who's ill, someone who's grieving. And there'll be a place in my prayer where I will provide you with an opportunity to speak their name. I will, I will say, especially we pray for, and I will pause. And if you have such a person that you're concerned about, I'd like you to speak their name audibly during that time. The prayer is ours, not just mine, but the whole congregation. Let us pray. Our God and Savior, we have assembled today because we are hungry for more than bread. We thirst for more than wine. We have other places we could be, other things we could do this morning, but we are desperately in need of your presence and power in our lives. But, O oh Lord, unless you meet us here, we will go away empty, still hungry for a word from you, still thirsty for your Holy Spirit. So we cry out to you today, come among us. Persuade us, disturb us, convict us, fill us. Here's our cup, Lord. Fill it up today. Father, keep us from merely going through the motions of this holy place. Deliver us from a complacency that ignores the contest between good and evil going on all around us and in the world at large today. Guard us from a hopelessness that says we're doomed to succumb to the forces of the evil one in these times. Believing that you've called us to your work in this community, we seek to know and do your will. Empower this congregation with the presence of your spirit. Give this body a great passion to reach and win children, youth, adults, and families with the good news of your love and salvation. We confess that we're not wise enough or strong enough to build your house. Therefore, we cast ourselves upon you and ask for your blessing. Bring to this church people who need you. Raise up people who can see things as they can become, not as things as they are. Help members to envision a strong, growing church where Jesus is honored and people are inspired to minister to the needy. Above all else, we ask for your presence in our assemblies with such power that we will know that we are a part of something larger and more wonderful than all the other places and experiences in our lives. Bless those among us who hurt or grieve or despair or are lonely or are in depression or have lost their way. Bring them home. Especially we pray for Tim and Jenny Bright. Holy Spirit of God, open your word to us today that we may become your people this week. We pray as Jesus taught. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Giving is an act of worship. Let us bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord at this time.
Okay. You may be seated. I am taking the liberty today to add a, other, another scripture reading. There's one that is listed in the order of service, and that is in Isaiah 43, verse 18 and part of 19. And then I'm going to also read from Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, which is found on page 1920. While you are looking those up, I just add this note. I am not the pastor. I'm filling in. And if you are visiting, don't be discouraged. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> pastor Joseph will be returning. Also, I want to say that when we came to Greer, my wife and I, and search for a church. We visited a lot of churches. It's not an easy task, as some of you know. This is about a year ago now. We wanted a church where women served with equal status to men. So happy that this is that kind of church, symbolized today by women ushers. You know there are some churches in this town that would never happen. And uh, it's important for us. So we appreciate, we appreciate that. Now I know that you just were standing, but out of respect for God's word, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word. Isaiah 43. Verse 19, forget the former things and don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And the second is Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. By the time this service of worship is concluded, 11 Christians in the world will have died because of their faith. And as you retire to your bed tonight, more than 137 Christians will have perished because they dared to claim the name of Jesus. And when you awake to begin another day, 88 Christians will have put, been put to death while you slept. I can say this because the Center for the Study of Global Christianity in the United States estimates that 100,000 Christians now die every year targeted because of their faith. That's 11 every hour. The Pew Research Center says that hostility to religion reached a new high in 2012 when Christians faced some form of discrimination in 139 countries, almost three quarters of the world's nations. The struggle between good and evil, right and wrong, God and Satan, has never been more intense. The stakes are so high that the future of humankind is up for sale. In more than 139 countries around the world today, Christians in many places cannot own a Bible. It's illegal. 
They cannot share their faith in Christ. They cannot change their faith or teach their children about Jesus. And those who boldly follow Christ in spite of government edict or radical opposition face harassment, arrest, torture, and even death. Yet, Christians continue to meet for worship and witness for Christ, and the church in restricted nations is growing, while in Europe and the United States it is declining. So what in the world is going on? I liken these days and these times to those of the first three centuries of the Christian church. The Roman Empire was doing unspeakable things to Christians, but believers boldly stood for their faith in Jesus and paid with their lives. And not since those early times have we witnessed since atrocities against Christians. In my judgment, it is not only similar to the first three centuries of the church, but it is a powerful indication that we are living in the end of times. What in the world is going on? It is exactly this. God is doing a new thing in the world. You see, we're currently living in one of the most transforming moments in the history of the Christian church. Over the past five centuries or so, the story of Christianity has been all about Europe and North America. However, over the past century, the center, the center of gravity in the Christian world has shifted to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And today, the largest Christian community on the planet is found in Latin America. Now, in order to grasp the situation currently of world Christianity, let us consider what happened last Sunday. More Roman Catholics attended church in the Philippines than any country in Europe. In China, where in 1970 there were no legally functioning churches at all, more believers probably gathered to worship than in all of so-called Christian Europe. And in Europe, the church with the largest attendance last Sunday was in Kiev. And it is a church of Nigerian Pentecostals. Last Sunday, more Anglicans attended church in each of Kenya, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda than did Anglicans in Britain, in Canada, and Episcopalians in the U.S. combined. And several times more Anglicans attended church in Nigeria than any of these other African nations. In Korea, where a century ago there existed only a bare handful of Christian believers, more people attended the Iotic Full Gospel Church in Seoul than all of the churches in American denominations. It has approximately one million members. In the United States, Roman Catholic Mass was said in more languages than ever in American history. And last Sunday, many churches with the largest congregations in England and France were filled with African or Caribbean faces. In Sub-Saharan Africa in 1960, the Christian church numbered around 60 million people. That figure today is between 350 and 400 million. But that's not all. Even though you won't hear about it on the evening news or read about it in the New York Times, there's a new revolutionary movement sweeping China. This movement could, within just a few years, transform China and alter the political alliances and balances of the entire world. It's called Christianity. 
Christianity, explains David Eichmann in his book, Jesus in Beijing, is growing so fast that by 2050 or even earlier, China could be one of the largest Christian nations in the world. God is doing a new thing in the global church. Indeed, these are perilous times, but God has a message of hope for us. It is that God is doing a new thing. It is a message that was delivered to God's ancient people in the midst of national devastation. Their nation had been destroyed by the Babylonians and people were taken captive. And approximately 40 years of captivity went by before the first contingent of captives made their way back to Jerusalem to undertake the enormous task of rebuilding their lives. But while they were still in captivity, Isaiah delivered a message of comfort and hope to them. The whole message was filled with powerful assurances of God's presence and care. And the words still bring comfort and hope to people of faith today. Listen to the prophet's message. He will take care of his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Even those who are young grow weak. Young men can fall exhausted, but those who trust in the Lord will find hope and their strength will be renewed. They will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be weak. When you passed through the deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. And when you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. The hard trials that will come will not hurt you, for I am the Lord your God, the God of Israel who saves you. Now, Isaiah's message was meant to lift the spirits of persons in captivity, kindle hope in their hearts, and prepare them for the challenge that God was about to present them. This was the challenge. God said to them, forget the past. Don't dwell on yesterday. Look, I'm doing a new thing. It's starting now. Do you see it? By the past, God was referring to the good things that had happened in their history, not necessarily their sin, destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity. He reminded them how he had led them out of Egypt, how he had opened the Red Sea and swallowed up their enemies, and how they had drunk water from the rock in the wilderness. God told them as great as all of that was, he was doing a new thing the redemption and restoration of his people, Israel, to the land, the coming of a savior, and the creation of new heavens and new earth. Now, it took eyes of faith for the captives to see what Isaiah already saw happening. Some were able to behold it, and they made the arduous and dangerous journey back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, their homes, and their lives. But others could not see it, and they remained behind in Babylon. But God was doing a new thing. Once again, Isaiah's message of hope is relevant for us. God is doing a new thing in our church, Memorial Methodist Church. We are losing our skilled and faithful organist. Our pastor has announced his retirement next June, and he may not be able to always give full attention to our ministry because of his caring for his aging and health-failing parents. Woe is me. What's gonna to happen to us? 
If this is God's will, what in the world is he up to? Well, today I implore you to look forward and not backward. To focus on the opportunities God has given us. Instead of wringing our hands, it is an opportunity to put them to work. Let us use the time from now till next June as a gift, a gift of opportunity to take a good look at ourselves, what we are doing that works, what we are doing that no longer works, what new ministries are calling for our leadership, service, and commitment, what old programs need to be retired. It is an opportunity to examine our structure. Is it encumbered by too much organization and too little hands-on ministry? Have we become too institutionalized? We mean, need to be reminded that God is always a work among his people, the church. He calls us to new goals, challenges, and dreams. And whenever a church stops reaching for the future, setting new goals for ministry and dreaming new dreams for God's work, it has stopped seeing and hearing what God is about. Whenever a church becomes focused on the past, it has already begun to miss out on God's current activity. Whenever a church decides that the situation is hopeless, it has already been blinded to the new thing that God is doing. Therefore, let us not miss the excitement of ministry, the thrill of the Great Commission, go and make disciples. Let us not, having put our hand to the plow of God's work, look backwards. Let us rise up to seize the future in Greer. Let us embrace the new thing that God is doing. Let us affirm the stirrings of God's spirit among us. Let us become a great people of faith who have not yet reached the mountaintop. Let us behold what is yet to be. Let us become what we are not yet. Let us be bold, courageous, and visionary. Let us run the race to win. Now the upward forward movement of God's people has always depended upon leaders who with the eyes of faith see the future. They have a vision of how things can be. They like Isaiah already see what God is doing. Consider some examples. By faith, Noah being warned concerning events as yet unseen, constructed an ark, saved his household, and became the heir of righteousness which comes by faith. Abraham left his home and went to unfamiliar territory because with the eyes of faith, he saw a city that had not yet been built, whose designer and maker was God. He became our father of faith. Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And when many people were unable to see who Jesus was, Peter, with the eyes of faith, saw clearly, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Once again, God is doing new things among his people, but some churches are not able to accept it. Instead, they tenaciously cling to old ways of doing things. Forget the past. Don't dwell on yesterday. Look, I'm doing a new thing. It is starting now. Do you see it? May God give us leaders who perceive the new thing that God is doing among us and lead us into the future. Finally, Isaiah's message may have something personal for you. Are you stuck in the past, going over old things? As great of God's acts of salvation and leadership have been in 
the past in your life, he's doing something new. Do you perceive it? He has new experiences, growth, and service in store for you. Can you see it? It takes the eyes of faith. Eyes that see things not as they are, but as they may become. Has your employment situation suddenly and dramatically changed? Maybe adversely. God has something new in store for you. Can you see it? Has your marital status changed, bringing separation or divorce or death? Do you feel like a complete failure? Does it seem like you'll never love and be loved again? God is prepared to do a new thing in your life. It has already begun. Can you perceive it? Are you unhappy with the way things are in your life? Don't get hung up in the past or stuck in the present. Reach out to God. Open your life to him as never before. Give yourself to the Lord all over again. Seek God's will for your future. See what God is going to do for you. Forget the past. Don't dwell on yesterday. Look, I'm doing a new thing. It's starting now. Do you see it? Now, God knew that the new thing he was doing for his people would not be easy for them. When Isaiah envisioned the cap captives returning from Babylon, some may have imagined a wide, smooth highway to Babylon to Jerusalem, and on the road was a large crowd of people marching triumphantly, banners flowing, trumpets sounding, God going before them. Meanwhile, the survivors in the destruction of uh, Jerusalem who remained behind to eke out an existence, were anxiously awaiting the entourage. They ran down the road to meet the new returning sisters and brothers. They would march together into the ruins, acknowledge the Lord as their king, and set about rebuilding their lives. The city and the nation, there would be singing, dancing, and laughter. Well, it wasn't quite like that. No new highway was built. The returning captives looked more like a band of refugees than a triumphant remnant. Their survivors in the ruins of Jerusalem were not sure they wanted them back, and the surrounding nations were certain that they didn't. The appointed governor did not look exactly like the powerful king of Isaiah's message and vision. And having arrived, the people had to literally fight every day just to stay alive. It's not easy for a church or an individual to follow God into the future, to do a new thing. And that is why God gave them and us so many assurances. He said that he would carry us like a shepherd. He would strengthen us when we're weak and tired. He would be with us through the deep waters and trials by fire. Today, some of you are at a very low point. You're grieving the death of a spouse, brother or sister, or friend cut down too soon by cancer, heart disease, or diabetes. You're going through deep waters. You're being tried by fire. God says to you, I am with you. And here's the thing. You're going to come through the waters. You're going to escape the fire. And the loved one who may have succumbed has already won the race. And you will too. Your loved one is already beholding the face of God. Your loved one is free of cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And when you are reunited, you never again will say goodbye to any loved one. Never again will you cry tears of pain, grief, separation. You win. Today, some of you are ill and fearing for your life. 
you are weak and tired. And God says to you, I will strengthen you. And here's, here's the thing. Whether you live or die, you win. Because where you're headed, there will be no more illness. You will be healed and be in God's presence. Today, some of you are feeling lost, a career or marriage slipping out of your grasp. You feel like your life is out of control. God says to you, my child, I will carry you like a shepherd. God has a future for you. He is doing a new thing in your life. Can you see it? In ancient days, those who saw the new thing God was doing for his people did return to Jerusalem. They did rebuild their homes, the city, and their lives, and God was with them as he promised. And while I liken these perilous days to those of the first three centuries of the Christian church, in that unspeakable atrocities against Christians are being perpetrated as they were in the Roman Empire. I remind you that Christianity overtook that empire with its evil acts. So today the evil that seems so powerful will not exceed, succeed because as it is, Jesus said of his church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. However, there will be many martyrs. And like Isaiah's message over 2,500 years ago, my word for you today is one of comfort, hope, and challenge. God is doing a new thing in the world, in the global church, in our church, and in our lives. This morning, God says to you, forget the past. Don't dwell on yesterday. Look, I'm doing a new thing. It's starting now. Can you see it? Our hymn is number 105.7, Let Us Stand to Sing. 